Hello, uh, my name is Josh Chapman, and we're going to talk about how to do wavefront sensors in the lab today. So here's an outline for uh, our talk. Uh, first off, we're going to talk about Zernike polynomials, which is the reason you build a wavefront sensor to help you to calculate these, and so they can help you analyze your beam. And then we're going to talk about two different wavefront sensing technologies. Uh, one is the shock partment technology, which has been around for many decades and is uh, cheap to implement in front of a CCD. We have one for prolapse. The other one is a quadri wave lateral shearing interferometry, which we have a wavefront sensor that implements that from phase X. So we're going to talk about how each of them works and how to use their software. Right, so first off, uh, if you're unfamiliar with the Zernike polynomials, they're an orthogonal set of polynomials for the unit disk. So you can see some of their uh, profiles over here. There's a list of some of the polynomials. So uh, these are useful because um, each of them can uh, describe a certain aberration in an optical system. So for instance, some of the first couple are tip and tilt, so it's just uh, horizontal deflection or vertical deflection. And then um, they also have defocus, so this is if the beam is diverging or converging, and then a lot of these other ones uh, come up in uh, lens systems where these are aberrations caused by the lens, so many people are familiar with uh, spherical aberration where this is um, different parts of the beam will focus at different points along the propagation axis. So um, one of the reasons that decomposition like this is so helpful is because many of these different um, aberrations are fixed in different ways. So, for instance, tip and tilt are often uh, due to the alignment of your beam, or defocus is due to the relative position of certain lenses, but a lot of these other ones are due to uh, the actual lens construction itself. So that is often can only be fixed um, with uh, better lenses, or maybe you could uh, add some more lenses to help. But uh, in general, these have a wide array of different ways to fix them. So if you have a messed up beam, this can help you tell which parts of that are due to optics and maybe which parts are more due to your alignment. Okay, so now to quickly discuss what a shock Hartman wavefront sensor does. So there's two elements to this wavefront sensor. You have a micro lens array, which is many lenses in an array in front of a sensor, like a CCD camera. So the way this is set up is if there's a flat wavefront coming into the wavefront sensor, then that micro lens array will focus many spots into the center of, say, a certain section that is the section for each lens. Level. So if the beam is deformed, then the, uh, the spots will focus in different places in the respective areas. From this information, the deviation from the center or the calibrated spot is how the wavefront sensor calculates the uh, Zernike coefficients. Right, so here's a screenshot of uh, the Thor Labs wavefront sensor software. So I'd like to point out a few things. So first off, you can see this is the raw image of the CCD camera with the focus spots from the or the micro lens array. And I like to point out that the uh, pink cross is the centroid uh, calculated from the beam, and the uh, pink circle is the analysis pupil. So if you remember, the Zernikes are defined on a unit disk, and so you want the analysis pupil to be the set to the size of the beam so that you're analyzing the beam and not um, half the beam or um, mostly black space. So there are options that allow you to set it so it's the right size and it follows the beam around. So over here, you can see some calculated quantities, which we'll talk about some more of those later. And down here, there are different tabs to allow you to view um, different calculations. So for instance, there's the line view, which is like a one slice uh, along the camera. And then the beam view is the uh, reconstructed beam. Uh, and there's the wavefront, you can view the wavefront 3D, and then there's the bar graph of the Zernike coefficients. So we're going to go to that one. And um, so 
So using the software, if you uh, double click on any of these plots, you'll get a plot specific graph to help you adjust things how you want. Um, and then if you right click, you can bring up uh, the setup settings. So for instance, there's the camera settings. And these are important when you first install the software on a, on a camera because uh, this allows you to change how many images you average before it calculates something. So if you have uh, low power or if uh, you want a very precise measurement, you want to up the number of averages. And uh, additionally, if you can't raise your laser power up another way, you can increase the exposure. Um, also, you want to set this so it's above the noise floor. Um, next, this is where, this is the pupil definition page, and this is where you, if you select use beam width and use beam centroid, then this will have the, uh, the pink cross and the pink circle. The cross will automatically calculate the beam centroid and keep the analysis pupil centered on that. And then if you use beam width, it will automatically adjust the circle diameter to follow the beam as it changes. Say if you're focusing or defocusing it, it'll change the size so it calculates uh, the zero keys correctly. Right, and finally, um, not final, almost finally, um, this is the definition of the zero keys. So on that bar graph from left to right, these are the zero keys that it's plotting. So I often go back here to refer to remember what uh, zero keys I'm looking at. And this is useful because uh, there's actually a few different standards, so if you use a different software, it's important to look at what the ordering is so you know what you're doing. Um, there's also some errors that you need to be careful about. So in the bottom of the screen, there was a, there's a message bar, and you want it to say no instrument errors in the green checkbox. Uh, if you don't get that, it's not reliable. So there's a few things that you need to be careful about. You want the lights off, so there's a lot of contrast, you don't have a lot of background. Uh, you'll get a message if the power's too high, you get a message if the power's too low. So you need um, just the right power, so it's very helpful if you have a way to adjust your power. And the power that you need is often only um, around half a microwatt, so it's not very much. Um, additionally, the beam diameter needs to be sufficiently large so that there's enough micro lens spots in it that you can get a accurate enough uh, calculation of the wave reconstruction of the wave. Um, so at this point, I'll take any questions that you might have about the Thorlabs wavefront sensor. What sort of accuracy can we get with it? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Sorry, but that's quoted on there. What about the wavelength frames in this picture? Um, so this is a visible, it's a silicon CCD, so I think that would be uh, good from four, three or 400 up to, I've used it with 1064, but I don't know what the accuracy change is with that. Depending to the right one, uh, You can, but if I remember right, that is only if you want to to do with like a power measurement. It doesn't, I don't, it doesn't actually seem to correct for wavelength. I could be wrong. Um, okay, so next we'll talk about the uh, quadrilateral wave. Quadri wave lateral shearing interferometer. So what this is, is instead of a micro lens array, you have a diffraction grating which makes four copies of your beam that are slightly displaced. So um, the way they do that is they have a phase profile that approximates a bi-sinusoidal grading, so you get a, uh, four Dirac spikes, or as close to possible as you can get using um, etching in two different levels to give you a pi plus and minus pi phase shift. So when you do that, then if you send a beam on there, you get uh, many fringes like this. And on the left, you can see a flatter wavefront. 
And on the right, you can see a spherically apparated wavefront. And you may notice that the, uh, the I think it's the frequent, the spacing changes as you go across. And so instead of doing a direct um, measurement of where the spots are on the screen, they use a Fourier analysis. So they'll look at Fourier space. So they'll see as you uh, change parameters of the wavefront, they'll see the spacing of in spikes in Fourier space change. And this is what allows them to uh, reconstruct the wavefront. So here's kind of the front, uh, the front office, the main, the main window for the phasic software. Um, there's calculation uh, windows that you can open up here. And over here is how to set up acquisition. So we're going to talk about, if you, first you need to click on the camera window. And uh, this open ups, opens up the raw uh, CCD image. And again, you need to uh, select the analysis pupil. So for this one, actually you select an oval pupil with a 13% clip. And then uh, you need to make sure the power is high enough. So it needs to, between, needs to be between like 200 and 250. Um, and you can change the exposure to help you do that. Again, you can uh, adjust image averages if you want to increase your accuracy. Um, additionally, this wavefront sensor is a uh, phosphor-coated uh, CCD. So you, we use it for IR that then uh, phosphoresces down up to uh, a higher frequency, and that is detected by a silicon CCD. But you can also, um, if you want to check this box, you can use it uh, by just sending on visible light. Um, they don't guarantee the performance as much, and the wavelength range isn't continuous based on the phosphor they use, but we have used it, I've used it at 800, and it seemed to have fairly comparable performance to the four lives wavelength sensor. So after you get that set up, then you want to go back to this main window and hit real time. So that's continuous acquisition. Then um, you want to hit mask auto. So this is an extra feature we had to buy so that the analysis mask would move with the beam as it uh, changes during line. So at that point, you're ready to use the wavefront sensor. And uh, most likely, you're going to click one of these buttons, which we're going to talk about now. And that uh, is the calculation buttons. <coughs> so often, we use the wavefront sensor to help us align things. So one of the buttons is the beam parameters. With the different x and y tilts. So this is uh, usually one of the first couple of learning keys. And then you can look at the reconstructed uh, beam, this is the intensity profile, to help you know where it is on the camera. Uh, and you can select this cross, put it at the maximum or any point on there, and leave it there while you look at a different beam and try to, try to use it to help you align. And there's a, you can calculate the radius of curvature, and then also the beam parameters. So these beam parameters are a calculation assuming a Gaussian beam. So this can take your wavefront that's hitting the camera and then give you the, uh, the Rayleigh range, the uh, beam waste, and actually the beam waste location. So um, this is helpful if you want to know where your, uh, where your beam waste is. And to, just to note that when you have a negative number here, that corresponds to distance in front of the camera. So that helps you, that can help you locate uh, where the beam waste is. And then I was told by physics that if you want to use uh, measure an accurate m-squared measurement, that you should reduce the uh, clipping on in the camera settings window for your analysis mass down to 5%. So additionally, they have a few more calculations. So you can Calculate the strobe ratio, which can be helpful in, uh, for turbulence simulation. You can also calculate the uh, far field, uh, what, what it would look like in the far field. And what they mean by that is if you have a lens, the size of your aperture, what does it look like at the focus? Um, and then they have the calculation of the encircled energy, which is um, if, so say, um, you were to have it have focused down and look at like a diffraction limited spot, maybe there was an airy disk pattern. So this encircled energy is how much of the beam's power is in the central, central uh, uh, circle. 
Um, and finally, you can also calculate the zone key switch. You probably aren't surprised that you can do that. One thing to note is that if you want to calculate the Zerna keys, you, um, you actually need to turn this off first and open up the Zerna key window and then turn this back on. Uh, because this uh, it's a little software glitch where they gray this out and this is on. But if you do it in that order, then it works just fine. Right. So, um, Inclusion, we talked about a few different wave front sensors and their, uh, their software and how they operate. Uh, is there any questions about the uh, phase X wave front sensor? So the power had to be between 200 and 250. What are there units on that? So, yeah, um, you want about um, a f one to five milliwatts per centimeter squared to see intensity. So, it's actually a lot more power than the uh, wave that's a good question. Because it's a fluorescent. Yes, because you're going, you're trying to have a phosphor fluorescent, and that's what hits the system. So, the phasix wavefront sensor would also work for the telecom wavelengths, correct? Yeah, that's what it's designed for. For the IR. So around fifteen hundred. Uh, power acceptance notwithstanding, are there any obvious reasons to use one wavefront sensor over the other? Well, the, um, the Thorlabs one, uh, the one that we have is designed for visible, uh, and the Phasex one is designed for the IR. That's one, one main reason. They do have slightly different calculations, as you can see. Uh, that could be another reason. But, so, the Phasex one as you can see, it could be kind of used as a beam profiler also for the IR, which we don't have, where we also have, we have visible beam profile and we have visible wavefront sensor. Um, also one thing to note, uh, the Thorops software you can get from the website, we have the Physics software and there's a little USB license key that needs to go with it when it goes into but it's already, both of these are already installed on the current.